Hello, I'm Clough Shelton, and I'm an otologist at the Otologic Medical Group and House Ear Institute in Los Angeles. This is Shanks, who's an audiologist at the VA Medical Center in Long Beach and the University of California, Irvine. During the next hour, we will review some of the basic principles and clinical applications of tympanometry and acoustic reflex measures. These measures are particularly appealing in a clinical ENT practice because they provide a rapid, atraumatic, and objective technique for evaluating the middle ear as well as the seventh and eighth nerve function. Some of the uses of tympanometry are to measure the integrity of the middle ear transmission system, estimate middle ear pressure, and check the patency of pressure equalization tubes. Acoustic reflex measures can also be used to evaluate seventh and eighth nerve function and also can be helpful in alerting the audiologist and physician to the presence of ear canal collapse or functional hearing loss. Next, Janet will discuss the principles underlying tympanometry and acoustic reflex measurements. I will follow with some representative case studies demonstrating the clinical application of these measures. Several different terms have been used to describe tympanometry and acoustic reflex measurements. The earliest instruments of the 60s measured acoustic impedance, or the opposition to the flow of acoustic energy into the middle ear. The next generation of instruments measured the reciprocal of impedance, or acoustic admittance, which is a measure of the ease with which acoustic energy flows into the middle ear. Although technically incorrect, the term compliance is used interchangeably with admittance. Acoustic emittance is a new generic term used to refer either to acoustic impedance or acoustic admittance measurements. All currently available instruments use acoustic energy to measure the combined admittances of the ear canal and middle ear. Here you see a diagram of a typical instrument. The probe assembly has three tubes. One is connected to a miniature loudspeaker or driver. One is connected to a microphone and the third is connected to an air pump. The loudspeaker, or driver, delivers a 226 hertz probe tone into the sealed ear canal. The intensity of the probe tone is measured at the microphone. A feedback system, or automatic gain control circuit, is used to keep the tone at a constant sound pressure level by continuously changing the voltage to the driver. The change in voltage necessary to keep the intensity of the probe tone constant is dependent on the admittance characteristics of the middle ear. For example, if the ear is abnormally compliant or mobile due to disarticulation of the acicular chain, most of the acoustic energy of the probe tone will be absorbed into the middle ear and very little of the energy will be reflected at the eardrum. Consequently, the driver voltage will have to be increased by the automatic gain control circuit to keep the level of the probe tone constant in the ear canal. The driver voltage, which is proportional to the acoustic admittance of the ear, is displayed on a meter or can be output to a plotter. The air pump connected to the third tube in the probe assembly is used to vary the air pressure in the ear canal during tympanometry. The probe is fitted with an individually sized ear tip to achieve an airtight seal in the patient's ear canal. Here you see the probe sealed in a patient's ear. The acoustic admittance can be monitored on a meter or can be output to a plotter for a hard copy of the test results. In order to interpret tympanograms and acoustic reflex measurements and to correlate these findings with audiometric results, it first is helpful to review the transmission properties of the normal middle ear. The acoustic admittance measured at the probe tip represents the combined effects of the ear canal, all the middle ear structures, and to a small extent, even the cochlea. It is not simply a measure of eardrum mobility. The acoustic admittance you measure depends on the stiffness, mass, and resistance offered by all these structures in the middle ear 
and on the frequency of the probe tone you use to make the measurements. At low frequencies, such as 226 hertz, the middle ear is stiffness controlled. Elements of the external and middle ear that contribute to the stiffness are the eardrum and the enclosed volumes of air in the ear canal and middle ear space. Middle ear pathologies that increase the stiffness have the greatest effect on the transmission of low frequency signals. An increase in stiffness associated with such things as extreme negative middle ear pressure, middle ear effusion, and otosclerosis, therefore will produce low frequency hearing losses. This pattern of hearing loss on the audiogram typically is referred to as a stiffness tilt. The middle ear is mass controlled at high frequencies. Some of the structures in the middle ear that contribute mass are the ossicles and pars flaccida of the eardrum. If the mass of the middle ear increases, hearing will decrease in the high frequencies. This pattern of hearing loss is referred to as a mass tilt. Therefore, if you want to evaluate the mass characteristics of the middle ear, you should use a high frequency probe tone. The frequency where stiffness and mass are exactly equal is called the resonance frequency. Normal middle ear resonance falls between 800 and 1200 hertz. The middle ear is stiffness dominated below resonance and mass dominated above resonance. Resonance is shifted in the presence of middle ear pathology. If a pathology such as otosclerosis stiffens the middle ear transmission system, the ear will be stiffness controlled over a wider than normal frequency range and therefore resonance will increase to a higher frequency. Conversely, if a pathology such as acicular discontinuity produces a decrease in stiffness or an increase in mass, the ear will become mass controlled at a lower than normal frequency and resonance decreases. The cochlea contributes to the resistance measured at the probe tip. Unlike the stiffness and mass components, resistance does not vary as a function of frequency. Most of the commercially available instruments measure the magnitude of admittance, which represents the vector sum of stiffness, mass, and resistance at a single low probe frequency. A few of the instruments, however, measure the contribution of these components individually. These instruments display the algebraic sum of mass and stiffness and resistance as two separate components called susceptance and conductance. This form of expression is most common in instruments that use high frequency or multiple frequency probe tones. Because most physicians use single component instruments, the examples used throughout this tape will be expressed as a single number, the magnitude of acoustic admittance, using a low frequency probe tone of 226 hertz. Acoustic admittance measures fall under two broad categories, tympanometry and acoustic reflexes. Tympanometry provides information regarding the general mobility of the middle ear as well as eustachian tube functioning. A graph showing changes in admittance as air pressure is varied in the ear canal is called a tympanogram. At high positive and negative pressures, the eardrum becomes extremely stiff. At these pressures, little acoustic energy flows into the middle ear and the admittance decreases to a minimum. As air pressure in the ear canal approaches atmospheric pressure or zero decapascals, there is an increase in the flow of acoustic energy into the middle ear and admittance increases to a maximum value. The maximum flow of energy into the middle ear occurs when the pressures on both sides of the eardrum are equal. The following three values typically are calculated from the tympanogram. An estimate of middle ear pressure, an estimate of ear canal volume, and an estimate of the static admittance of the middle ear. I will demonstrate each of these calculations on a normal tympanogram. The peak of the tympanogram occurs when the pressure in the ear canal is approximately equal to the middle ear pressure. If the eustachian tube is functioning properly, the peak will occur near zero decapascals. However, if there is a negative middle ear pressure, then the tympanometric peak will occur when a similar negative pressure is applied to the sealed ear canal. The ear canal pressure corresponding to the tympanometric peak, therefore, provides an estimate of middle ear pressure. Normal middle ear pressure typically falls between minus 100 decapascals and plus 50 decapascals. The volume of the ear canal also can be estimated from the tympanogram. 
The admittance recorded at the probe tip represents the sum of the admittance of the ear canal volume and the middle ear. At high positive or negative pressures, however, the eardrum becomes extremely stiff and the admittance of the middle ear is reduced to zero. The admittance value measured at a high positive pressure, such as 200 decapascals, therefore provides an estimate of ear canal volume only. This measurement is called the physical volume test, or PVT. If the eardrum is intact, the volume estimate at 200 decapascals is of the ear canal only and should average around 0.5 cubic centimeters in children to around 1.5 cubic centimeters in adult males. If the eardrum is perforated, the volume estimate will be greater than 2.5 cubic centimeters because the volume now will include the ear canal plus the middle ear space and mastoid air cells. This large volume typically averages 8 cubic centimeters, but the maximum value that most admittance instruments will measure is 5 cubic centimeters. A volume estimate is especially useful when a flat tympanogram is recorded. Here you see the effect of volume on flat tympanograms. This shows a normal ear canal volume of 1.5 cubic centimeters, which is consistent with an intact eardrum, whereas this example shows a large volume greater than 5.0 cubic centimeters, which is indicative of a perforated eardrum or patent pressure equalization tube. The admittance of the middle ear without the effects of the ear canal volume also can be estimated from the tympanogram. Recall that the admittance recorded at the probe tip represents the sum of the admittance of the ear canal and the middle ear. When the admittance of the ear canal at 200 decapascals is subtracted from the peak admittance value measured at the probe tip, the admittance of the middle ear alone can be determined. This calculation is termed static admittance. Here, the static admittance is calculated from two different tympanograms. This is an example of low static admittance, and in contrast, this shows high static admittance. The clinical use of static admittance has been somewhat controversial because of the large range of normal variability and overlap with a pathological population. The most popular method for categorizing tympanograms is on the basis of shape. Five basic types of 226 Hz tympanograms were identified by Ledin and Jurger in 1969. Type A is a normal tympanogram. The peak admittance is normal in amplitude and in pressure. Peak admittance near zero decapascals or atmospheric pressure is consistent with a normally functioning eustachian tube. There are two subdivisions of the type A tympanogram. The type A sub S tympanogram is similar to the normal, except the peak amplitude, or static admittance, is reduced. The reduced amplitude is typical of an abnormally stiff middle ear due to otosclerosis. The type A sub D tympanogram also demonstrates a normal tympanometric shape with normal middle ear pressure, but the amplitude is abnormally high or deep. This increase in amplitude is associated with ossicular discontinuity or eardrum pathologies, such as a neomembrane or tympanosclerotic plaques. Type B is a flat tympanogram typical of middle ear effusion, eardrum perforation, patent pressure equalization tube, or impacted cerumen. The physical volume test can help to differentiate among these conditions. Type C tympanograms are characterized by a peak at an extreme negative pressure, typically less than minus 100 decapascals. Recall that the maximum transfer of acoustic energy occurs when there is a zero pressure differential across the eardrum. A negative peak on the tympanogram suggests a similar negative pressure in the middle ear. The second category of measurements are acoustic reflexes. When an intense auditory stimulus between 75 and 95 dB hearing level is presented to one ear, the stapedius muscles in both ears contract. When the muscle contracts, the stapes is rotated slightly, which produces a stiffening of the acicular chain and eardrum. This increased stiffness is recorded as a decrease in admittance, coincident with the presentation of the intense acoustic signal. Contraction of the stapedius muscle attenuates low frequency signals with the maximum effect near 600 hertz. Because the change in admittance associated with contraction of the stapedius muscle is so small, 
the sensitivity of the instrument when switched to the reflex mode is increased by a factor of 20 over that used for recording tympanograms. Here's a simplified drawing of the acoustic reflex arc. The reflex arc is comprised of three to four neurons. The first order neuron, the cochlear branch of the eighth cranial nerve, carries impulses from the hair cell in the cochlea to the second order neuron in the ventral cochlear nucleus. The second neuron passes through the trapezoid bodies with direct ipsilateral pathways to the motor nucleus of the seventh cranial nerve. The third neuron near the medial superior olive has connections with both the ipsilateral and contralateral motor nuclei of the seventh cranial nerve that innervates the stapedius muscle in the middle ear. The primary application of acoustic reflex measurements is in the evaluation of seventh and eighth nerve pathologies. Integrity of the eighth nerve is required to elicit a response. An evaluation of eighth nerve function, therefore, is made at the input or stimulus ear. A marked conductive or cochlear hearing loss in the stimulus ear, however, can attenuate the signal reaching the eighth nerve. The degree of hearing loss in the stimulus ear, therefore, must be considered in analyzing the responses. Integrity of the seventh nerve is required for a response to occur. An evaluation of seventh nerve function, therefore, is made at the output or probe ear. Evaluation of seventh nerve function, however, is not possible if there is a coexisting middle ear pathology in the probe ear. The diagram further shows that unilateral stimulation at high sound pressure levels results in bilateral contraction of the stapedius muscles. It is therefore possible to stimulate one ear and to measure the response either in the ear ipsilateral or contralateral to the stimulus. The consensual nature of the acoustic reflex, therefore, makes it possible to elicit and measure the response under four different conditions. Traditionally, the ear refers to the stimulus ear. Stimulus right and probe left is the right contra condition. Stimulus left and probe right is left contra. Stimulus right and probe right is right ipsy. Stimulus left and probe left is left ipsy. Acoustic reflex measures fall into one of two categories, acoustic reflex thresholds or acoustic reflex decay. First, we will discuss acoustic reflex thresholds. Acoustic reflex threshold is the lowest stimulus level required to elicit a response or a measurable change in acoustic admittance. To determine the threshold, the stimulus level is gradually varied until a decrease in admittance is noted, either on a meter or on a graph. The acoustic reflex threshold in this example is 85 dB HL. Thresholds to pure tone stimuli can be determined for each of the four stimulus probe conditions just mentioned. The next five illustrations demonstrate the pattern of reflex thresholds expected with different types of pathologies. This first example shows the acoustic reflex pattern expected in a patient with an eighth nerve lesion on the left side. Acoustic reflexes are absent whenever the stimulus is presented to the affected side. Left contras and left ipsies are absent. Right contra and right ipsy reflexes are normal because the stimulus is presented to the normal right ear. The dash function here shows that acoustic reflex thresholds are absent in 70% of patients with eighth nerve disease, even when pure tone thresholds are within normal limits. As mentioned previously, a conductive or cochlear hearing loss also can affect acoustic reflex thresholds. A conductive hearing loss in the stimulus ear, shown by the solid line, attenuates the sound reaching the cochlea and eighth nerve by approximately the magnitude of the airbone gap. To elicit a reflex, the intensity of the stimulus must be increased enough to compensate for the airbone gap. An airbone gap in the stimulus ear of 25 to 30 dB is sufficient to decrease the likelihood of an acoustic reflex by 50% and a 50 dB airbone gap in the stimulus ear will decrease the likelihood of a response by 90%. The dotted function shows the effect of a cochlear hearing loss in the stimulus ear on acoustic reflexes. 
reflex thresholds remain normal and constant for cochlear hearing losses up to approximately 40 dB hearing level. Above this level, reflex thresholds increase with the degree of hearing loss. Reflexes are absent in 50% of patients with cochlear hearing losses of approximately 85 dB hearing level. In general, an acoustic reflex can be elicited to within 15 to 20 dB of pure tone air conduction thresholds in patients with cochlear hearing losses. This is the reflex pattern expected in a patient with an intraaxial brainstem lesion. Acoustic reflexes are absent in both contra conditions but present in the two ipsy conditions. When the lesion is in the efferent or output portion of the acoustic reflex arc, acoustic reflexes will be abnormal whenever the probe is in the affected ear. Here is the reflex pattern expected with a seventh nerve lesion on the left. Right contra and left ipsy reflexes are absent. For both of these measurement conditions, the probe is in the left ear. Reflexes are present for the left contra and right ipsy conditions, both recorded with the probe in the right ear. Absent reflexes suggest that the lesion is central to the stapedial branching of the seventh nerve. In contrast, present reflexes with known seventh nerve damage suggest that the lesion is peripheral to the stapedial branching. The most common pathology affecting reflex responses at the probe ear is a middle ear pathology. The stapedius muscle may contract when an intense signal is presented to the ear, but the contraction is not intense enough to alter the acoustic admittance characteristics of the middle ear. Acoustic reflexes are absent in approximately 75% of ears with air bone gaps of only 10 dB in the probe ear. The only exception is fracture of the stapes crura, which is central to the insertion of the stapedius tendon. In this case, acoustic reflexes can be recorded with the probe in the ear with the conductive hearing loss. The next two illustrations summarize the reflex patterns expected in a mild and a severe unilateral conductive hearing loss. In the case with a mild conductive hearing loss in the right ear, left contra and right ipsy reflexes are absent because the probe is in the conductive ear. Right contra reflexes are elevated because the stimulus reaching the cochlea is attenuated by the air bone gaps in the conductive ear. Only the left ipsy condition is normal. In a severe conductive hearing loss in the right ear, the left contra and right ipsy reflexes again are absent because the probe is in the conductive ear. In this case, the right contra reflexes also are absent because the level of the stimulus tone cannot be increased high enough to compensate for the large air bone gaps. The second type of acoustic reflex measures is called acoustic reflex decay, which is a measure of the change in acoustic admittance measured during prolonged auditory stimulation. Stimulation typically lasts for 10 seconds. Patients with cochlear hearing losses maintain the same change in admittance throughout the 10 second stimulation period, whereas many patients with eighth nerve pathology demonstrate more than a 50% reduction in admittance within five seconds of stimulus onset. Abnormal reflex decay is defined as a 50% or greater decrease in acoustic admittance within five seconds for a 500 or 1000 hertz activator presented 10 dB above acoustic reflex threshold. Reflex decay is not measured at higher frequencies because even individuals with normal hearing will demonstrate some decay at 2,000 and 4,000 hertz. In most patients with eighth nerve lesions, however, it's not possible to measure reflex decay because reflexes are absent. Clough will now demonstrate the clinical application of tympanometry and acoustic reflex measures with several case studies. I will present a series of cases that will illustrate the application of tympanometry and acoustic reflex measures and the results expected from a variety of pathologies. In each case, the opposite ear will be assumed to have normal hearing unless otherwise stated. We will present the audiogram for the ear under consideration as well as the shape of the tympanograms and the pattern of the acoustic reflex responses. For purposes of discussion, the reflexes will be described as present, elevated, or absent. As in the previous examples, the contralateral condition will be shown in the top portion and the ipsilateral condition in the bottom portion of the figure. When indicated, 
We will also show you the shape of the acoustic reflex response. The first patient is a 28-year-old female with a slowly progressive hearing loss in the right ear. Her mother and brother have a similar history of hearing loss. You can see from the audiogram that she has a moderate conductive hearing loss. The tympanogram for that ear shows a normal shape with reduced peak static admittance that is classified as a type A sub S, which is consistent with otosclerosis. Some patients with otosclerosis do not exhibit a stiffening effect on the tympanogram, but instead have a normal type A pattern. The acoustic reflexes are absent in the left contra and right ipsy conditions, which are the two conditions with the probe in the ear with the conductive pathology. An increased stiffness in the middle ear prevents the right ear from yielding a measurable acoustic reflex. In addition, the right contra reflexes are elevated. Because of the extent of the conductive hearing loss, the stimulus tone presented to the right ear must be made sufficiently loud to compensate for the ear bone gaps in that ear. Only the left ipsy reflexes are normal. A clinical diagnosis of otosclerosis was confirmed on middle ear exploration. She underwent a stapedectomy to correct the hearing loss. Here you see a less common acoustic reflex pattern occasionally recorded in early otosclerosis. The conductive component typically is so slight at this stage that the patient may not complain of a hearing loss. Acoustic reflexes are present with a probe in the conductive ear, but the response is atypical. This pattern, referred to as a biphasic or on-off response, is characterized by a brief change in admittance at the onset and offset of stimulus tone. The next patient is an 18-year-old male who suffered a head injury in a motorcycle accident one year ago. He had bleeding from the right ear after the accident and has noted a right hearing loss since that time. Fortunately, his facial nerve function is normal. The x-rays were consistent with a longitudinal temporal bone fracture in the right ear. Pure tone audiometry revealed a maximum